When I was eight years old, I had brain surgery. And it's not something that I've ever openly talked about or explained or really gone into depth about. Not out of any fear or horrific trauma. It's not something that a lot of people can relate to, so I've never really felt the need to open up about it. It all started when I was eight years old. I was diagnosed with juvenile epilepsy. At first, my parents didn't believe me. I would get random spasms, my leg would start to shake, just my fingers, it would just be like that. But I had no control over it. My entire arm would spasm, sometimes my whole body, but that was very, very rare. And it usually only affected one half of my body at a time. Eventually my parents realized that, yeah, okay, this is a thing. Something is happening and we need to deal with it. And so I was taken to a doctor and it took forever to diagnose. One of the first exams I ever had was an EEG. And it was really, really weird because they felt there was something wrong with my brain. And my brain's response to something was causing these seizures. And so they hooked me up to all these sorts of different electrodes that were stuck all over my head and some monitoring different vital signs. And then I had to just lay there with my eyes closed and there was bright flashing lights and I don't know exactly what they were doing. It wasn't terrible. It wasn't terrifying. It was just annoying. I mean, imagine how hard it is for an eight-year-old to sit still that long. But that was just the beginning. I had all sorts of examinations with doctors poking and prodding me. I had all sorts of blood tests taken. And eventually I ended up having CT scans and an MRI. So they show me this room, and it was kind of cool actually when you think about it. It was this giant room with this giant machine, and it had a castle built around it. Because here we have a children's hospital, which is specifically for children and women giving birth. And I was like, oh, that's kind of cool. I want to go in a castle. But then it actually happened. Just as I was getting settled down on the hospital bed that is shoved into this machine, they say, okay, so you need to stay really, really still. And don't talk, you know, don't do anything, all right? There's gonna be some really loud noises, but you gotta stay really, really still because we wanna get images of your brain. And I'm like, okay, sure, sure, loud noises. I can deal with that, no problem. They put me in and everything's going okay and there's clunks and bangs and it's so small and I'm small but it's small and eventually I'm just I realize how alone I am in there and my parents aren't there and I can't see the doctors and I they're not really talking to me so I just start crying and I start bawling <laughs> and they had to stop because I couldn't stay calm and because I was crying I couldn't stay still and so they're just like okay well this is over <laughs> this is not happening so they had to pull me out and they had to calm me down and then they're like well we have to do this we have to get these scans and so they decided they were gonna put me under for it if I'm un unconscious I'm not gonna move I'm not going to cry. I'm not going to ruin anything. The brain activity might be a little lower, but they can still look at my brain, right? Up until this point, I've been poked and prodded by so many people and had so many tests done that nothing really bothered me at this point. So I remember being in this little room with my dad and the doctors and the nurse and they put down a plastic thing on my back of my hand where they're going to put the IV in and it has a cream or a gel on it that numbs the area and the, so they take that off eventually and then they get ready to put it in and I'm just sitting there and I'm staring at it and I watch and it's a huge needle it's not like the IVs that they have now which are really really tiny and you barely feel anything I mean I still freak out but you barely feel anything and I just watch it go in with like 
utter fascination. And then they hook everything up and it's ready to go and they're like, okay, we're gonna go and do this. And then I don't really remember anything after that. All I remember is waking up and my dad was there and one of the nurses was there and they gave me a popsicle. And the only thing I remember about this popsicle is that it was a really bright color. I don't actually remember what color. It could have been blue, it could have been pink, it could have been purple, but I just remember it was bright. And I was sitting there happily and they're doing all their checks and everything to make sure I'm okay. And they're like, we got it, everything's good, you can go home. We just gotta, you know, sit here and rest for a bit and then your dad can take you home. And so I'm sitting there eating my popsicle. There was an uh-oh moment. You know that moment? Everybody has it at some point in their life. And it's usually when you go sprinting for a bathroom. Well, I didn't have that option. Instead, I was like, I'm gonna throw up. And they grabbed just one of those cardboard basin thingies and they shoved it in front of me and I just puked. And the only thing that came up, because I hadn't eaten beforehand, was popsicle. <laughs> And I just remember the color of the popsicle coming up, and yet I still can't remember the color of the popsicle. And they're like, uh-oh, somebody's having a bad reaction to the anesthetic. And they're like, well, you can still take her home, just keep an eye on her and all that sort of thing. And so we're walking out of the hospital, it's just me and my dad, and the halls are empty at this point, because I think it was later in the day, because there really was nobody around, which is really strange for a hospital. There's usually one or two people wandering around at any time. And down the hallway, there was a railing and there was just like washcloths and towels hanging on it. And I stop in the middle of the hall and I was like, oh, and my dad's like, oh crap. And he grabs one of these towels, poor hospital staff. And I just like puke my guts out <laughs> into it again. <laughs> And my dad's like, okay, okay, we'll get you, well, let's, let's get you to the car, let's get you home. And so he grabs another towel and he just like, I'm like, you're stealing. <laughs> He's like, they'll understand. <laughs> I just remember this moment so clearly. I don't even remember getting home or anything like that. But when I got home, I didn't get any better. I was still having a really violent reaction to the anesthetic that they used to put me under. My mom got really, really worried. And I mean... I don't blame her. Your little eight-year-old girl is puking her guts out and she just feels like absolute crap. So she took me into the emergency room. And the emergency room, they they needed to get fluids into me and like give me a um, anti-nausea medication or something, but they had to do things intravenously. And I remember this is the precise moment. This is when it began. I remembered watching that IV go into my hand and then it clicked like this is what did that to me. This is what's made me feel like that and I was done. Needles, no more. I just could not do it anymore and I couldn't look at this needle and they had to put me on my side and face me away and have my arm at a really awkward angle just to get the needle into me and I just remember crying and like that was it. That was it. I've had a very severe phobia of needles ever since and honestly until a few years ago I did not put two and two together to realize what had caused it and it was this moment. And as you can imagine my family has tried to get me over this. My mom is like, it's totally mind over matter, and, you know, it's all in your head, you just gotta go, and like, it doesn't work like that, it's a fear, okay? It's something that has affected me and I have just built up inside me and it's something I need to overcome, but I just, I can't, you know? My parents used to have an, an inkjet, in, an inkjet printer, like one of those bubble ink printer thingies that you have to refill the ink cartridges for and to do that they had a giant syringe with a giant needle that's not really a needle on it but you would insert it in and then push the ink into the cartridge and I just remember one of my brothers tormenting me with this like I was a teenager at the time probably you know an early teenager maybe 13 or 14 but he would just torment me. He would chase me around the house with it, like full on display, just chase me. And I would 
scream and I would just be absolutely terrified. And Quinn, you're an asshole. But the point is this, this is what affected me and that moment changed the entire course of my life and it changed an integral part of who I was. When I was a kid, I had absolutely no fear. And then suddenly, anxiety was my middle name. And I just spent the rest of my childhood a giant anxious mess. So, what they eventually found through these myriad of scans and tests was that I had a malformed blood vessel in my brain. And that blood vessel was dripping blood onto my brain. And every time it did that, I would have a seizure. And those seizures, depending where it hit, affected different parts of my body. And if it was on the right side of the brain, it affected the left. And if it was on the left side of the brain, it affected the right. And when I was eight, I knew a lot more about the brain than I remember now, which is absolutely crazy, but I was super curious, so I always asked questions. They found what was causing this. They could, they could fix it. And they had gotten me on an anti-seizure medication, and at eight years old, I couldn't swallow pills at first, but after a few weeks, I was swallowing pills dry. I was just, I was pro. I could get them down, no problem. That only helped so much. I still had the occasional seizure, and I still had problems, and so they had to go in. They had to go into my head, and they had to fix the problem, or this was going to affect me my entire life, and it would only get worse. My parents were trying to convince me, I think, that I was just going in for another test, like another MRI or something, and they were going to put me under. And so they got me up early in the morning, and my youngest brother had just been born. He was just a baby, and he's still nursing, and so he came with us, and both my parents were there, which is what tipped me off in the first place. And I'm sitting in the hospital hallway with my mom and my dad, and I'm just sitting there, and I'm perfectly okay, and I'm like, okay, this is gonna happen, and they take me in, and they get me all ready, they get me into the gown, and all of this stuff, and they do the same thing with the IV, and this time, I was not okay with it. Finally, there comes this moment that the doctor comes in and he's like, okay, we're gonna do this, you know? And I, I already knew at that point, I was like, they're, this is it, they're taking me in for surgery. The doctor posed a question to me. He's like, okay, do you wanna walk? Or do you wanna have a super fun ride and we'll wheel the bed down? And I was like, fun ride, I want them to go on the bed. By the time they had rolled me down the hallway to the operating room, I had this moment, this, this thought in my head that just went, I should have walked. It would have taken longer and then I could have stalled. I just, I remember that having that thought. And so we're sitting outside of the operating room and they give me something to drink. And I was like, okay, and I drink. And I had no idea what I was drinking. And that's honestly the last moment I remember <laughs> until I woke up. Apparently after the fact they had learned from their first mistake of putting me under and it was some sort of anti-nausea medication that is now standard practice with uh, cancer patients when they're undergoing chemo. And so they had given that to me. So when I woke up, I was actually fine. I didn't have the same problems that I had the first time. But I woke up in the hospital room and my head was bandaged and I learned everything that had happened. When you have brain surgery, or when I had brain surgery, because I honestly don't know the current standards and practices, but I have three holes in my head. Three excess holes in my head. One is right here, and then the others are here and here, and shaved part of my skull, drilled into my skull, marked out the place, and cut open it, and popped it open, just to get at my brain, which is, somewhat disturbing and alarming to think of that my brain was open and exposed in a room to people and I woke up and I was fine. You'd expect to be in pain or overly anxious or something. I was perfectly fine. I was tired but I was fine. 
what is comfortable. And they predicted that I would be in the week, in the hospital for a week and a half to recover. I wasn't. I was only in the hospital for four days. I don't know what it is about me, but I have this incredible ability to heal much faster than anyone I've ever met. By the second day, I jumped out of the hospital bed and landed on my dad because I was bored and I was sick of sitting still. They had to actually get me up and doing things because I was just so restless and I just, I couldn't sit there. It was so boring. They brought in, oh yeah, when I woke up in the ICU, because after you come out, you go into the ICU, which is the intensive care unit, because you just go undergone a major surgery and they need to keep a very close eye on you. And I woke up. And I was just, I was awake, and I was on, and it was the middle of the night, and the nurses had no idea what to do with me, because I was just like, I want to do something, I was like, ready to go. I just had brain surgery, and they had to scramble to find a television so I could watch cartoons. <laughs> it was like three in the morning, but I was just like, with it, and I was happy. I, <laughs> they didn't know what to do. Uh, I, they did have a school in the hospital and I got to go there I think once or twice and that was super fun because I got to play all sorts of games and things like that but I ended up going home a lot sooner than I was supposed to and I'm weird I guess. I'm fine with being weird, I own it, but it's not exactly something you expect to have undergone a major brain surgery and within four days you're back at home and then within a few weeks I was back at school. I was in grade two at the time and I had special permission from the school to wear a hat because I still had a bald patch on my head and I had staples sealing my skull shut. I don't actually remember anybody trying to knock my hat off or trying to tattle on me or say, ooh, I want to see, I want to see. Like, I don't remember any of that happening. I guess the teacher must have explained beforehand to the class what had happened and to be respectful. I don't know. But you would think a bunch of eight-year-olds would not be so, like, laid back and chill about it. But they were. And eventually, like, Things just went back to normal. My hair started growing back and I had the staples out, which they're like, you're just gonna feel a little bit of pressure. And you know when they say that, it means it's gonna hurt like hell. And it did. It did. My mom had to like pin me down just so they could pry the staples out of my head. And look at me now. I have not had a single seizure since I've had brain surgery. And I'm so incredibly lucky for that. People out there have to live with their illnesses their entire lives, and that just sucks. When I was eight, I had brain surgery, and I'm a different person for it. I mean, you, you can't even look at the path and understand completely how I changed so much, but it profoundly affected me, and how I look at the world, and how I view myself, and how I view others, and I am more than willing to put myself out there for other people who need me, who need my support, and I may not understand exactly what you're going through. Nobody ever will, because every moment of your life is so profoundly different than anybody else's. Don't be afraid to take the help when it's offered to you. If I hadn't had that surgery when I was eight years old, I would not be who I am now.